was in Hyderabad one year during his uh, travels and he was told that there is a Shia Ithnashri village only 400 kilometers from Hyderabad. His words were that when I arrived in this village, what I see is that there were eight-year-old kids to 60-year-old men and women doing one thing and one thing only. They were rolling the Indian beeries, the Indian cigarettes. And he was told that the entire village has got a loan over the years from a loan shark, a Hindu loan shark. And they are doing this to pay the interest of the loan shark, the compound interest. And he said, I cried when I saw those kids and that entire community beholden to one debt uh, of this Hindu Marwari. And he said, these were debt slaves. Instantly, he instructs the people to say, call the man here. He negotiates with him for a measly sum of, I remember, about five to 6,000 UK pounds to relieve an entire village of three to 400 people of debt slavery that they had had for generations. I remember that our house in Nairobi was always busy. There was always guests because in those days, Nairobi wasn't uh, a, a town that was well populated by the Shia. Almost uh, every week there would be somebody passing through. It could be a scholar, sometimes it was just friends living in different parts of the world. So um, early memories of my time with my father was uh, always busy, but he had time for family. Later on, of course, as we got older and then we migrated to the West, uh, the dynamics of the relationship changed somewhat. Um, you know, we weren't kids anymore. But um, my relationship with him was, was very good. Um, I respected him greatly, uh, not just because he was my father, but because of the kind of achievements he had and uh, he would always be there to support, to guide, to advise. It was past midnight. The inmates in the cell were all half asleep and then a massive metal door creaked and sleeping inmates sat erect with all alertness like a flock of frightened sheep expecting the slaughterer to enter the pen and make his pick. A harass entered. Behind him, the young man. Blood streamed from his chest, back, arms. He had been chastised with the lashes, which turned his skin violet and showed the marks clearly. His ghost-like appearance scared everybody. Most of us unable to meet his glance, which showed utter helplessness and distress. And then, when we saw Abu Mahmud with a wry smile hanging on his face, I had been here a few months ago, and then I was released. As I went home, I informed some of my relatives and family and friends about the whereabouts from their missing members. I told them they were all detained by the Muhabarat and that I had met them. And I am now arrested again and convicted of having disclosed the secret. Abu Mahmud blurted and every one of us answered in a chorus. The message was conveyed. The young man hardly able to walk was then pushed out of the door, taken away to where nobody knew. You know, the Koja community's awareness regarding the oppression or the political conditions in Iraq was pretty minimal at that time, apart from some student activists like myself who were involved with other Iraqi students with the issue of Ayatollah Bakr Sadr and his sister Bint al Huda, um, the general community was more concerned about not getting visas for Ziyara, and that really was their big concern rather than the oppression by Saddam. It appears that uh, it was a normal visit to Iraq. The Ziyarat were complete. Amongst the things that my father did uh, was to go and mis visit Marhum Sayyid al Khoi. Um, he knew him, he was his wakil, 
and uh, I'm not entirely sure what transpired between them, but it was a regular visit. My father told me that as he was leaving, uh, after meeting the marja, a person said to him that, uh, I heard you say to the Sayyid that you are going to London. My father said, yes. He said, would you do me a favor? And I said, what is it? He said, I have family in London, but if I was to write to them from here, my letters would not reach. I have written a letter and it's in this envelope. I ask you when you reach London, please put a stamp on it and just post it to the address that is written on the envelope so that my family can get some news. Now, it was a, not a very unusual request. Those are not the days of internet and email and perhaps he felt he wanted to write a letter. In any case, my father didn't think anything of it. Um, he took the letter. This was somebody who had been sitting in, in the presence of Sayyid Khoi. So he took the letter. It was probably a talabe or someone like this. And he says to me that uh, he quite forgot about the letter because he gave it to my mother. It was in my mother's handbag. And when they were leaving, they checked in, they checked their baggage. And when the flight was called and as they were going towards the flight, at the door, security personnel stopped him and my mother. And they took them to the side and said to them that we have some questions for you. So my father was very surprised at what would be the questions. And they said to him, that you took a letter from somebody. So my father explained that this is what happened. He said, well, that person is a person of interest for us. We have been watching him. And we consider him to be uh, behaving in a manner that is threatening to the state of Iraq. So we are detaining you. My father said, you're welcome to the letter. We have a flight to catch. He said, the flight has gone now. And at that time, then, they were taken away to prison in Baghdad. Um, it transpired the letter was just you know, normal things. There wasn't anything in the letter that was particularly uh, implicating my father in anything. It was a perfectly innocent uh, thing. But, you know, Saddam was paranoid at that time about everything. I get this phone call from my cousin, uh, and uh, he informs me that he has learned from the family and uh, his brothers in Mombasa that uh, Mullah Sahib was due to return to London and it's been almost a day and over and he has not been seen. And that really put us all in great anxiety. And my first rec recollection was, oh my God, this is Iraq, this is Saddam. And I was praying, you know, and hoping that it was not as worse as I thought it would be in, in Saddam's Iraq. My sister had come to the airport to get him, to, to welcome him. And uh, when he didn't arrive, there was obviously some confusion initially, especially because when they began to check with the airline authorities, the airline authorities said that he had, you know, he had been uh, checked in. He had checked into the flight. But if he checked into the flight and he had not come here, then there was growing alarm over the first couple of days. We didn't know exactly what had happened. Um, my sister then began to uh, check with the uh, authorities further up. Whatever she could, she contacted her MP and said, we have a problem here. Mullah was quite a famous personality, even at that time. His uh, sermons and orations were quite famous. Uh, in my young days, I, you know, we, we used to listen to his um, uh, his uh, sermons on, on on a tape recorder on the week and the spool, spool tape recorders, and so we all knew about Mullah. Mullah's family was quite well known, and you know they came from the same um, town in Mombasa as my mom did. So we, we were aware of of uh, and when he was um, uh, taken as a prisoner, it, it was it was big news. It was. Uh, um, Everyone knew about it, you know, we, we were all aware of, of what was happening, yes. We had no news until five days later. A passenger from London who and his wife, his name was Mr. Muhammad Rafiq Pir Muhammad of Dubai, who was married in the Datu family in Mombasa, were at the airport also leaving for London. Now, when they saw Mullah coming out, they could not have any communication, but Mrs. Pir Muhammad recognized Mrs. Mullah 
and by gesticulation asked, how come you're going out? And her remark was a complete unawareness of what's, what's going on. For five days after landing London, he was making discreet inquiry. Has Mullah come? Has Mullah come? But he did not announce. When five days passed, then he went to the community mosque and announced that this is what I had seen in Baghdad airport. And that's how the news came about. Had it not been for this fact, the case of Mullah Asghar would have been like that of Musa Sadr in uh, Tripoli, in Libya. Musa Sadr left Tripoli to go to Rome. He had his boarding pass and he disappeared. The Libyan authorities maintain that he has left on a Italian flight to Rome, while the Italian authorities maintain that he has never landed in Rome. And exactly the same thing happened with Mullah Asghar. He had the boarding pass. So according to the manifest, he has boarded the plane. But he had not landed in London. Now, had it not been uh, uh, for the fact that Mr. Rafiq, Mr. and Mrs. Rafiq saw this incident, up to today we would not have known where he had disappeared. We felt that the best route to this was the political route, rather than the legal route. So on the one hand, uh, and most importantly, he was a Kenya citizen. And therefore, the community leaders in Kenya firstly approached the Kenyan government to seek officially information from the Iraqi government as to where one of their nationals was. Secondly, the then president of the World Federation, Marhum Haji Haider Haji, had connections with India and the, and the prime minister of India, Indira Gandhi, at that time. So he actually flew to Delhi to meet up, especially with Indira Gandhi, the prime minister of India at that time, to talk to her about Mullah Sahib and to see what the Indian government could do to actually seek his release. On the other hand, we had al Haj Mustafa Gokal, who was in London at that time, who had connections with the, with, with the King of Jordan, King Hussein, and he actually approached King Hussein to see if there was any way that one could facilitate getting more information and seek his release. So you can see that the efforts were multinational, multifarious in every way that we possibly could. I personally went to see the Iraqi ambassador, accompanied by Marumullah's daughter, to actually seek officially uh, on behalf of his daughter to say, where is my father? He went to Iraq, he has not come back. There was no information whatsoever that came from the Iraqi government. There was simply silence. Indeed, I recall the Iraqi ambassador telling me that, well, he was a businessman, maybe he was trying to smuggle some money out, and, you know, he'll be out, you don't have to worry too much about it. That's the kind of casual reply he gave and diplomatically kind of uh, threw us out of his office. People used to converge in mosques, come home to inquire. All the family members were being approached. We had telephone calls from all over, from Madagascar, from Australia, from all over the world inquiring. Okay, but we had no news, nothing could be said. We did not know at that time, but one of the things that we did not realize, and he writes this in his book and he talked to us when he came back, to say each time an inquiry was made on his behalf, they realized that this must be some important man. And therefore, you know, his trials and tribulations in fact increased every time an inquiry was made on his behalf to say why are all these people so worried about this one man. But obviously we had not realized that at that time. In a well-lit room, a muhaqqet sat on an elevated platform. In my first encounter with him, the blindfold was slightly raised by the harass, enabling me to see the interrogator and survey the room. Asghar, do you pray? The question seemed strange and totally irrelevant, but then I thought that perhaps they wanted to establish if I was truly a Muslim. As days passed by, I understood the implications.
Samir, an Egyptian young man, looked quiet and well behaved in the cell. But his story was astounding. He travelled with strangers and on the way would politely offer tea. The traveller soon went into deep slumber and Samir helped himself with all the contents of the stranger's wallet. Here, I reckoned, was a boy who would be severely punished and detained for many years. But he was released within a month. The Ba'ath regime does not tolerate religious learnings. Just as we sat one evening to eat the upper crust of the half-baked bread called Samoon, with tasteless curry which had more water in it than any of its usual ingredients, young Musin entered. Most of his inmates seemed to know the newcomer. They greeted him and welcomed him to the meal. He was a resident of Samara. I found him reticent but cordial. He prayed regularly and sat for dhikr. Early one morning, we chanced to be alone near the hammam for wudu, and he explained his plight in detail. I was arrested because I was regular goer to the mosque and the shrines of Askariyan and accused of being associated with Dawa. They kept me here for four months and did not call me for Takekh even once. Then I was suddenly transferred to Abu Ghraib where I stayed for six months. I became acquainted with the cruel hearse of Abu Ghraib. Musin stayed for ten months and many more weeks, totally neglected. Iraq's present bath regime consigns religious youth to the dungeons of oblivion. Muhammad Ali of Samawa once stood up for Tahajud in the small hours of the night. In a packed cell, he managed to find a place near the door. During the final winter, he had just raised his palms for Kunut, when most unexpectedly, What sort of prayer is this? There was nobody there to answer, for Muhammad Ali was steadfast in his supplications, and those half awake like myself, pretended to be in deep sleep. Abu Mahmud stood riveted to the ground till Tahajud was over with a contemptuous grin said, You would not be here if God ever heard. Religious performances in the cell were looked down upon by the Haras and other officers who made unannounced short visits. To be seen with a rosary, a sibha, was the most intolerable offence. We said our tasbih with these rosaries hidden. A Haras saw one of us with this beautiful brown rosary in his hand and was red with anger. The massive door opened and a search began. Some twenty-five rosaries were found and they were all pushed out to the corridor for punishment. Azra! Do you pray? Yes. Do you speak Arabic or Persian? My interrogation continued on the same note. Do you read the Quran? Yes. <laughs> How can you read the Quran if you do not speak Arabic? This is common in a non-Arabic Muslim world. We are taught to recognize the alphabet and trained in recitation without understanding the language. Why did you visit Iraq? For Ziyad Abahain. Who sent you here? 
Nobody. I came here of my own accord. At my own expense. You are lying. You are lying. You know our people are very kind and considerate to the people who tell the truth. But if you are lying and you don't tell the truth, you will be treated like animals, but worse. Do you understand me? Yes, but I'm telling no lies. Are you Ayatollah? I am not Ayatollah. I was taken aback. Was I? I could not guess why they thought I was Ayatollah. What is your relation with Al Khoui? He's my Mujtahid. I follow his rulings in Islamic jurisprudence and regulations. What about Khomeini? No relations to Khomeini. Do you believe that he is a crazy mullah? And he is responsible for all the innocent lives of the Muslims? You are a Khomeini spy. So for that, I will take you back to your cell. What do we know? Any sort of defiance or any sort of bravery was broken down very fast. And there was one man who um, tried to defy them by reciting some poetry. He was from Sudan. He recited some poetry about, not against the regime, but about standing up for injustice and things like that. And uh, they put a blowtorch on his beard. He had a long beard. They put a blowtorch and burnt him till his chin. And, you know, he had weeping sores after that, and they threw him back in. Another one, they took him and they hit him with some sort of wires, so that even his clothes had entered into his back, and then throw him in the cell again, without any medical treatment or anything like that. And when that happened, everybody is shocked, horrified, and very fearful. Um, this was the kind of constant routine they would do. The ironic thing was that, so there were several people there who did belong in jail, who had done things like criminal behavior. Those were freed very early. They would go and uh, after an interview, once they were seen as not threatening to the state directly in any sort of seditious behavior, they go. But the ones who were innocently caught, like for example, one man, they had caught him because his name was the same as the name of somebody that they were looking for. He said to them, I'm not this man. I have never been to Iraq before. I just came for Ziyad. No, he was there. Um, another one said that they took him because he he wrapped something up in a newspaper and it had the picture of Saddam on it. And then he discarded it. They said, you discarded this, you disrespected it. And he was crying. He said, my mother is old. I told her I'm only going to the shops. And she's she must be terrified. You have taken me and, you, you know, I, she doesn't know what has happened to me. So this kind of random acts, which destroy people's lives, but to these people it didn't seem to matter that what they have done is they have destroyed, you know, peace in a family by these random acts that they were doing. How did they make tasbih out of the thread of a blanket that they had, so that they had a tasbih that they could use? Or, for example, his appreciation of saying that once a week, they get one boiled egg and he said this was a great gift from God that we actually had one boiled egg a week. Uh, he was blindfolded and he said, you know, I realized at that time that for a blind person, that blind person is resigned to his blindness. But for somebody upon whom blindness has been imposed, it almost feels so dark and we are so blessed to say that we have eyesight, that you appreciated eyesight so much more. Once there was a young man that they had found and brought him to the cell, because this cell was one cell in that he knew about. There was many cells there, but this was his cell, the one he was in for those four months. And this cell would fluctuate between having 40 people to sometimes having 200 people. And when they, it was full, you had to take shifts in sleeping. Somebody stood while another one rested, and then after a few hours he would tap him, the other one would stand, and they could not rest. But he said they had brought this young man, 
and he was crying and he was crying and he was calling out you know to his mother and when he went on crying like this at one point my father said to him he was an iranian by the way and my father spoke to him and said to him young man don't cry it is time to have some courage we are here with you inshallah but he spoke to him in persian when he spoke to him in persian the young man was startled because as far as everybody was concerned my father could only speak english and indian languages so the few people in the cell who would know a bit of english would be able to communicate with him there was no indians in there at that time one of the arabs who was there he said to him they used to call him doctor because he said to them i am you know uh, i have my my profession is to do with eyes so they thought he was an eye doctor one of them drew him aside and said doctor you spoke in farsi and that here is death he says to him that do you see in this cell we are about whatever number they were at least 10 people here are not prisoners they are spies they sit amongst us they look like us they have ragged clothes like us they eat the things we eat but they are part of the security forces listening to see what are we speaking about ourselves and he said if one of them hears you speaking persian you will be a dead man so he was immediately brought up to he was immediately startled to realize that within the jail not everybody was a prisoner it will be scary for anyone to think that he could spend a couple of nights in iraqi prison i mean that would uh, his experience if the youngsters of today read that then they would understand what it was like in the days of hajjaj bin yusuf al safafi 23 hours you were in the cell one hour they called it shams you were released and you had to walk around in the sun and get some air and then you're back for another 23 hours so the question was what to do don't forget many of these were intelligent people with you know uh, and being forced to sit there and do nothing can start to play on the mind so they would devise ways to occupy themselves and i remember my father saying that we had a routine in the morning we would wake up there was about 12 of them that had become close and that had been in the jail for a while and to pass time really something that today we wouldn't even think about they would sit in a circle and each one would say the address of the other 11 and give the house number the road name the city and the full address or if there was any any other detail and they would repeat it they would say inshallah one day when we are free we will get together and meet somewhere and uh, this was 86 84 in about 1991 about 7 years later so whenever my father would come to london he would stay at marhum muhammad hasan walji's house who is my sister's father in law even in, back in the day so he said we have that address it's an east coast address you know and he would, so marhum Mohammed Sen Walji came to him at the World Federation office and said, "Mullah, there is a letter that has come to my door, but everything is in Arabic." So when he looked at it, this was one of the ex-prisoners with him. Seven years later, said to him, "That doctor, uh, get this letter translated, because it is me. I was. This is my name, and I am in Belgium in the Red Cross uh, holding area." and i have some need of money about 150 pounds if you can do that for me send it care of the red cross it will be handy to me so my father wrote him a letter in fluent arabic and you know sent him more than what he asked for money in iraq in the days when i was confined there in 1982 one mu'min who had been several times to ziarat 16th time it was he was also brought there with me i was one week earlier he came a week later and he was weeping all the time crying because it was the same thing as in my case on the 15th day in the cell he started He said, "Do you know one thing, Asghar Ali? 
All these hadith of Imam Hussain coming to your rescue as a Zawar is bogus. Bogus. And Hazrat Abbas also is bogus. Astaghfirullah. There is nothing like helping. And if there would have been anything like that, I could not have landed in jail. And you could not have been here also. Both of us came for ziyarat. Where is the protection? So all this hadith is Fazat Abul Fazil Abbas looks after us. Imam Hussain looks after us. And we are under the pet refuge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He looks after us from the day we go to the day we come. All this is concocted story. Look where we are now. Now, it is said that if there is half glass of water, you can either say it is half full or half empty. It is the way you look at it. If you say it is half full, you are an optimist. If you say you're half empty, you are a pessimist. Uh, sometimes one bread can fill your stomach and say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Sometimes a plate of biryani cannot. Now there we were there. Of course we were under torture. But at the same time there was room for saying Allah thank you very much. We are at least alive. But he was so very much disillusioned that he started this from morning till Zohar time. When the time of Zohar came he started his namaz, prayers. After that, he had a habit of reading Ziyarat of Imam Hussain by heart, including Izn al including Vidar, because he had been there for the 16th time. Suddenly, he started, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah, and started weeping. When he finished, he came to me and he said, Do you know one thing? He said, I slept. And I slept and I saw someone tell me, his name was Abbas, he said, Abbas, Astaghfirullah, his name was Ali Hussein. Ali Hussein, Hussein gave his life, gave his dear ones for Islam. If he wants to test your love for him on the 16th time, you are not prepared to even pass the test. To say that for Hussein, I am prepared even to bear this. And I woke up. He who gave everything for Islam. For him, I am not prepared to even bear this much of tribulation. And I suddenly said, Abbas is useless and Hussein is useless. Well, he tests me. You love me. You are with me. Well, you may not be in Ashura. At least you are in Karbala. Come on, bear this much of the trials and adversity in the jail. One thing that he said once that still brings sometimes tears to my eyes, he said that one day one of the guards was well known to them. He was one of the guards who was in their block. He was eating an orange and he was peeling the orange and then he threw the peel and he ate his orange. He said that when he walked away, some of them said that that orange peel, we can get it in here. It is possible. It's not that far. It's only three feet away from the under the door. So he said for a couple of hours we devised something and we built something with a hook. And finally we had something sturdy enough, we pulled it in. And he said everybody got one square centimeter of orange peel to rub our teeth with. We, our teeth, we had not brushed teeth in months. And he said we were so delighted like little children. We, it was like Eid, we were patting each other on the back. It was happiness because we had one inch or one small piece of orange peel which you and I, we don't even look at it, we throw it. He did not know for almost four months, out of those four months and two days, as to where his wife was, whether she was alive or not. And the irony was, she was just across a wall in another room by the corridor where she was held with other women. His wife could not speak Arabic. And as she revealed later on, once she was in prison on the first day, she asked for a glass of water. So they were shocked that somebody dared ask for water. Can you imagine? Then they realized that this lady is, is a stranger, is not, is not a local, and she does not understand. She just said water, and she had a glass of cold water. That was the only glass of cold water she had in four months. Otherwise, you go to the tap and drink really hot water 
coming from the tap when the temperature outside is in 40 plus degrees. My mother spoke a little bit about her time there. It was very different in the sense that there, it was a dormitory-like setting, beds and women, lots and lots of women, each one with a small personal space and each one worried about their husbands or their sons or whoever else they had been brought with. She did not speak Arabic at all and nobody spoke Indian. And uh, it, was, uh, it was difficult. She said she, most of the day she would be in Salat and she would pray. And in fact, the guard would laugh at her, say, hey, you Hindi, you are always praying, praying, praying. Do you not know anything else? She didn't know what else to do. Uh, she would communicate sometimes. They had kind of like by sign language with the other women, you know, if they wanted something from each other. She said, I remember this. I don't know if it is in the book or not. But she said, I had not combed my hair for two months. You know, and she said there was a woman who had a comb, one of the other women who was prisoned, but it only had four teeth in it. And my mother said, will you give me this? She said, if you break one of the teeth, I will be very angry. She said, I only got four teeth in the comb, small little piece. And she said, no, I will try not to. And she said, then she borrowed from her and for one hour she combed her hair. For 84 days, my wife sat on the floor, on the corridor, blindfolded and isolated from other ladies who were there. She went without food for days till the Haras observed this and reported to Muhakek and the doctor, fearing that she might die of starvation. Sitting alone and unable to communicate with anyone, as this was not allowed in the corridors, she wondered what had befallen us. Not knowing where I was, she felt insecure and as she remembered our children, she wept for days on end till at last tears dried up. No one was there to pity her or say a word of consolation. Here in my cell, Thoughts about my wife tormented me most. Where was she? How would she put up with the situation so shockingly cruel? Unable to control my emotion, I burst into tears and my friends surrounded me pleading. Do not cry. Please do not cry. They did not know that my wife was also apprehended till I broke the news. They shook their heads in disbelief and I remember one Jordanian who walked away with moist eyes. Why? Why your wife? Why are these innocent women being tortured? The Muhakek sent for me. Say, who sent you here? Nobody. Today his voice was I sharp came on my own and accusing. The pilgrimage of the holy shrine. Have you been to Iran? Yes. Why? For ziyarat. Ziyarat? <laughs> Which ziyarat? To the shrine of Imam Reza in Mashhad. So. You are a president of a very big community back in London. I was. I have since retired. Our investigation reveals that you are the president of a Muslim World Federation. I am one of the founders. I am no more its president. So why didn't you tell us this before? Because you never asked me about my religious or social activities. I was supposed to answer your questions only. Do you love your wife? You will never see her again. We know we have caught a big fish. 
you will be executed. <laughs> The Harass was summoned to escort me back to the cell. I did not know where my feet fell as I walked with him in the alleys. On a personal level, yes, they began to after a while question him because it was his time to be sort of interrogated. And he would always say that the, the way the interrogation worked was when you went into the interrogation room, you would be fitted with a mask that covered your eyes and that smelt of sweat and, you know, perspiration. And really you could only see from underneath the mask, the shoes. He remembers the boots they used to wear and they had whips that they would keep hitting on the boots like this. And that's how they questioned. And they were questioning him in English. And the chairs were very small, almost like a chair for a nursery school child, a small chair. And one time they were questioning him. They said, why is there so many questions about you from the Kenya government, and from the UK government? Why are they pressing about you? Are you a very important person? He said, I don't know what they're doing. I'm here. But my family, obviously, is asking about me. They had no idea. They were taken um, to another uh, cell, another prison. And it was, like, very confusing. Sometimes they would say, yes, you get your clothes, and now we're releasing you. And they said the person who's going to sign your release is not here. So they were playing the psychological games with them. And at one point, they stopped believing in whether they would ever be released. And then suddenly, you know, they were asked to sit in a car, get their belongings, and they were driven to Baghdad airport. As suddenly as they had been detained, it was, again, suddenly they were released. And nobody until today, not even him, was able to figure out why were they actually incarcerated and why were they released. When his release happened, it was uh, very sudden. They called him and they said to him that uh, we would like to take you somewhere. And they took him to a room with a camera like this camera and they gave him a, 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 a statement. They said to read this. And in that statement he said that what, what he was made to read was that I have been a guest of the Iraqi government and helping them with inquiries. I have not been mistreated in any way. And uh, I testify that I have no recourse against the Iraqi government in any international court. I have no case against them. And I am now being released after having helped them with the inquiries. So they taped that. So it seems Saddam was worried about some sort of international uh, if you like, case against Iraq, not because he was scared of that, but because maybe it would stop him in his other agendas for some sort of uh, respect at a global level. So he, he read this. Then it was this time that in the next room was my mother, and he saw my mother after four months. And they said to them that we are now releasing you. So... They took them to the airport, but obviously his tickets and all had expired. Um, and um, then they brought them back. This was quite difficult because you, on the one hand you're being released, and then they brought them back into that holding place, but not the cell. And they said, you wait here till we sort out these things. And then the next day, again, they took them to the airport. This same, uh, my father said the surreal thing was that the same jailer who they'd got to know because he was working in uh, the prison, he said to him, so doctor, you are now leaving us. He said, yes. He said, come here. He came and recited the dua of, the, of travel in his ear. Inna alladhi faradha alayka al-Qur'an ala raddaka ila ma'ad, inshallah. Allahu khayrun hafidh wa huwa arhamur rahimin. And it was this kind of weird mishmash of people. People were working for Saddam. They had religion. At the same time, they were afraid not to do what he told them. It was a very odd place. And they traveled. My belief is that the key people who did whatever they could, obviously everybody tried, the London office, the people in Kenya, and all the other people who did their best. Uh, I believe that uh, it was ultimately the prayers of the people because there was nothing one could do to pressurize a tyrant like Saddam Hussein and being where he was. It was a matter of prayers of the people and Allah willed it that he was returned to us 
because nobody knew he was coming back almost, almost four months and I think two days was his imprisonment. We had no idea after four months and two days whether he was alive or dead. After they were released and they were put on the plane, so she was always telling him, don't speak to anyone, be quiet. You see, we never, never know, there could be informers here. This is an Iraqi plane we are traveling in. They can call back the plane, so please say nothing. She was nervous until she landed in London. He reached London, and when he came to London, his tickets had expired. But for some reason, they looked at him, they said, hey, what have you come here for? He said, my daughter lives here, and we want to see her. No story about what happened in Iraq or anything, and he was, he was released. When he was released, uh, he didn't know what to do. He, he was at the airport alone. Nobody knew he was coming because there was no way of communicating. As far as my sister was concerned, you know, there was no news. So he called her, he didn't have anything on him. He called her reverse and said, you know, when she picked up the phone, she couldn't understand it was him. She said, Where are you calling me from? Is it really you? He said, yes, I am at Heathrow. And that's how he was released at that point. He was very weakened, dehydrated. He is, uh, I remember, the dentist who saw him said that his teeth had all become loose and, you know, just in four months. Had lost a lot of weight. The same with my mother as well. They were physically in very poor shape just with this four months. But alhamdulillah that they were released. In the evening at about four o'clock or five o'clock, uh, some of us at the, from the World Federation office, we go to, to see him. And obviously he was, uh, he had lost a lot of weight. You know, his face was drawn. His spirit was as strong as I had always seen in him. He was not like a broken man who had come from a prison after four months and two days you know, in Saddam's prison. That was the strength of the man. And pretty soon, within 15, 20 minutes or so of drinking tea, and we were very cautious not to sort of disturb in any way, he himself started talking about his experience. And at the same time, he started sharing some of the humor that he relates in our Saddam's prisoner. Almost hours after his release that he had come back, he was able to make jokes. He was able to, and this was his way of perhaps sort of releasing his own tension. But he was a stronger man that he had gone in, and you could see that, and that was an inspiration that whatever hardship that you may go through, faith in Allah is something that keeps you so that you come out even stronger with your belief in a stronger human being. When he landed in London, he had lost 50 pounds. 50 pounds. And when for the first time in London he used a toothbrush, he was, they could not use toothbrush in prison. There was no toothbrush there. He used a toothbrush. His gums started bleeding. You can imagine how much protein he must have lost that his gum started bleeding. He himself, you know, used to say that, you know, it's only when he was in prison that he could really understand what others went through. And uh, um, he used it positively after when he came out rather than negatively. He hardly ever talked about it, so he, it wasn't something that he, he, he was looking for self-pity. But that made him a stronger person. The Iraqi community had organized a dramatization of the developments in Iraq and the confinement of people and how they're being tortured. So he went to see their dramatization. And coming out of that drama, he said for a couple of nights he could not sleep because they harassed or the head of the uh, prison who was a real tormentor. He said in the dramatization, he could virtually see the same person who was in his prison. For, for so many nights, he says, it was difficult to, to sleep peacefully. It haunted him. It haunted him for a while. I mean, he had never forgotten Iraq. He had never forgotten. After his return from Iraq, his empathy towards the Iraqi exiles, the leaders, and some of them 
were in leadership positions as recently as you know a few years ago after the fall of Saddam. They were in exile in London, and these people were in some serious dire straits, both economically, social, and 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 uh, 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 emotionally. And he was a great support. We did not realize this because he never talked about it as to what he was doing for them. It was only after his death when people came to us and said, you know, this was Mullah, he helped us. I'm in Iraqi exile. This is what happened to me. And there were so many such stories. So it was after his death that we realized as to how much he did for the Iraqi community while he was in London and elsewhere. I remember that my mother wasn't one to watch television much. And this is uh, something that uh, we, it was humorous in some ways, but it had a chilling sense as well. And she would say to us, if a program comes on television that shows prisons, call me. Um, and when we would go, and if there was something, we'd say, Mom, look, this is a, it's a movie. It's about prison. And you know, when they used to shut the doors at, in the evening, she would shiver and she would say, that is the exact sound. Every night they would shut it with that clang and we would, everything would go dark till the next day. So they carried with them a lot of these memories and scars and it was only four months, which is the interesting thing that people have been there for years you know, in those jails. And one can only imagine what kind of emotional trauma happens there. Wudu was one of the most difficult chores. Water from the tap sizzled our fingers and it was impossible to collect handfuls for washing the face and arms. But we liked assembling near the basins because it provided an opportunity for private conversations. Here, I met Yusuf, a Syrian Christian who had come to wash his wounds. His chastisement had been the most severe, his wounds most unsightly. I made a sympathetic gesture with my eyes to show my feelings. Making a similar gesture, he said, they say I am a spy, while in fact I am not. I am simple truck driver, regularly plying between Kuwait and Iraq borders. They insist that I must confess. How can I? If I am innocent, I would not know, even if they gored my eyes, removing them out of the sockets. This was the only punishment he could now envisage because he had undergone every other kind. In Gurfat Amalia, Yusuf had been lashed all over the body till he bled profusely. Yusuf could not sleep on Batanya because the roughly woven blankets stuck to the raw flesh and prickled him like needles. When he sat, the loose wool shreds would pull the wounds After two restless days, Yusuf went to Muhaket again, this time to be treated with electric shocks. <laughs> and exactly after two days, he went downstairs again. <laughs> he came back to the cell in a state which defies all description. In the following week of respite, his skin peeled off, water, blood and pus oozed out with a revolting stench. A huge impact on almost everybody that I know of in the community. It almost felt that the community had lost a father, that we were all like orphans. We were leaderless in some, in, some, in some ways. And when we first met that the work had to go on of the World Federation, 
we said we had somebody who had broad shoulders who could take on so much weight. Now there are 10, 15 of us here in this room, I said, and we all together have to lift that weight. It was going to be hard even for 10 people or more to lift the weight that he had. Well, it was one of the darkest days in memory. I mean, like, um, I was in clinic when I got a phone call that uh, my father's been, has, has collapsed in the office in the World Federation and that they have taken him to Northwick Park Hospital. So I immediately left for Northwick Park Hospital. Um, I phoned my brother as well that I'm going there. And uh, the moment I reached, and my brother Akhtar reached about a few minutes later, we went in, and the moment we walked in, the doctor said, are you the sons of, we're very sorry your father passed away. So it was a huge, huge shock. And of course, uh, you know, some of the um, World Federation uh, officials were there also because they had been in the office complex and they'd all rushed there as well. And uh, it's strange that there wasn't time to personally grieve initially because there was so many other things to take care of. On that day as well as for a few days, there was as if there was a void in, in my life. There was so much... I never realized that the amount of space I had given to him in my heart as well as in my life. We used to talk such a lot and he used to inspire me such a lot that when he had gone it felt like that there was, there was nothing, you know, for a few days there was nothing to inspire me. There was nothing to um, um, give me that buzz that I used to get. For quite a few weeks I would say that there was a big void. There was a great void, not just because he was my father, but also because I could lean on him for advice on almost anything. And I found that his advice was always pertinent and useful for me. And I still remember that, you know, for a month or so afterwards, I would speed dial him auto almost automatically from my office and then realize that, you know, he's not going to be there at the end of it. So this took a long time to get used to. He was a man of vision. He was a man who looked ahead. He wasn't so worried in small matters that were happening on the ground at the time, but he would see where what is happening. And then he would formulate some idea and policy for the future. And once he was convinced that it would be useful, he would be determined to see it through. He would gather around him the right kind of people. And he had tremendous determination, a tremendous energy that he could bring to task. So in that process, he left behind the legacy of the World Federation. He left behind a legacy of many books he wrote, many lectures, almost thousands of lectures he has given on a variety of topics, in a variety of languages. Um, he was an inspiring figure. You see, I don't pray for his acceptance as much as I pray for the opportunities to serve. And the day he grants me a new opportunity to serve, I believe that the previous ones have been accepted. Mm. Opportunity to serve. At all levels, the community as well as humanity. And I hope that this philosophy in my life, to the last breath, when Almighty calls me back, it will be there to tell my Lord, thank you for having given me life. Thank you for giving me life.